I am standing in a grove of trees in northeast India. Everything around me is absurdly green. It must be the greenest place I've ever been. My ancestors are from this land, and though my parents uh, raised me far away in America, I still identify with it. I recognize certain aspects from sum uh, summers traveling in Kolkata, the vast paddies of rice and fields of jute, the fruit sold on the trees, the color of the soil, even the smell. I'm here on a work trip, inspecting trees used for perfume and incense. My mission seems preordained. Shortly after the partition of India in 1947, my Hindu grandfather changed our last name from Buddhar to the more cosmopolitan Agarwala. Agarwala, literally a peddler, Walla, of incense. Agarbuti. Somehow, I have walked into a trap set by my family two generations ago. You see, for the last 15 years, I've studied yeast biology and genetics. And now, I engineer yeast to produce rare flavors and fragrances that are slowly disappearing from the world. This air is still and hot, and I am comically sweaty. It's hard, but I must focus. The trees in this grove have been planted and carefully manicured so that after a few years of cultivation, they can be treated with a controlled fungal infection, which rots the wood and creates its trademark scent. A guide takes me to a bandaged tree and gently unwraps it. He cuts off a piece of wood with his pocket knife and rubs it between his palms to release some of the fragrance. It's musty, earthy, like compost. But there's a slight sharpness that's hauntingly familiar. As we wander the property, the guide tells me this tree is the only wood that was allowed to be taken from the Garden of Eden. Ashamed of their nakedness, Adam and Eve wrapped themselves in its bark during their flight from paradise. In the Hebrew Bible, the prophet Balaam says the tree was planted in Israel by God himself. The Psalms describe the coming Messiah as being anointed in the fragrance of the wood's oil. Later on, the prophet Muhammad fell in love with the same smell. To this day, its fragrance is mixed with water from the Zamzam well and is used to wash the Kaaba twice a year at the center of Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Mecca, the holiest place in all of Islam. Um, if you haven't already, I encourage you to open up your uh, envelopes. Later that afternoon, in an office next to a processing facility, I'm presented with a distilled version of the smell. The facility director opens a vial of amber liquid and, uh, since it's too precious to hand over, wafts it towards me. It's a dark, heavy musk. One that hangs in the air well after the vials have been taken away. Its scent is a conduit of revelation, the fragrance of history and myth of God and his prophets. The conspiracy birthed by my grandfather 70 years ago and carried on through my research has brought me to this place, and I understand why. I am here to recreate God's own scent in yeast. I'm young maybe six, on vacation in India with my parents. My cousins and I sneak into a sparse, tidy room that belongs to the house matriarch, the woman who raised everyone who grew up here, some of whom, like my father, moved away to start new lives in the United States. I am not supposed to be here, and my young heart is pounding. In that moment, a lasting association is made, a faint scent that turns out to be endlessly intoxicating. 
This is the smell we have loved for thousands of years. But will the scent I create in yeast be real? Here's what I mean. Maybe you know this story, the myth from ancient Greece. Theseus sailed to Crete with his army to slay the Minotaur, and then sailed back a hero. For generations in Athens, his ship was well-preserved. Well Every time a plank rotted or broke, it was carefully renovated until the entire ship was replaced by newer, stronger materials. Which raises the question, is that ship the same one that Theseus sailed to Crete? I'd argue that there was no ship of Theseus to begin with. As he traveled to Crete, then back, the ship was constantly changing. Either this thing we call the ship of Theseus has always been the ship of Theseus, or it never was. So back in Boston, I think about how to explain my project, not to my friends, but to God. I imagine what the elephant-headed deity Gonish would think. See, when he was a boy, he had a human head. But he was killed by the god Shiva in battle. His mother, grief-stricken and enraged, threatened to burn down all of creation unless her beloved boy were brought back to life. She demanded that he be made immortal and worshipped as a god. Shiva was chastened, immediately sending out his servants to bring the head of the first creature they encountered, an elephant. Gonish was revived and attained immortality only after the gods spliced the elephant head onto the body of the boy. I think of Gonish because the groves of trees that produce this beautiful fragrance are dying for reasons beyond our control. And now it is my job to identify the exact molecules that produce this fragrance. I will design snippets of DNA with encoded proteins that are capable of making this molecule. I'll synthesize that DNA and introduce it into a fungal species, the yeast that we know how to manipulate. And I'll coax it to produce the same fragrance down to the molecule of the perfume that pleased God from the beginning. But instead of living in the plants that God himself planted, it will come from this new yeast organism that I have created, grown by the leader, thousands of leader, in gleaming steel fermentation vessels. I should confess, I didn't sleep well in India, and it wasn't the jet lag. I worry that I may be taking away something important and foundational from a scent that has been dear to the world throughout its history. Even though it might all be fiction, it's impossible to say whether the plant mentioned in the Bible is the same one written in the Vedas or the same one beloved by the prophet Muhammad. Still, this weighs on me, all of it. Is it rude that I should tell Ganesh what a burden immortality is? But there's hope. If things go well and the pieces align, I could create a new thing, a new living organism that will create the same molecules that lend the trees in India their awesome fragrance. It will survive long after the groves in Northeast India are no longer there. It has the potential to live forever. This could mean that someday we wouldn't need to mow down these splendid groves to attain their fragrance. We could divorce this oil from its various plant species, growth conditions, and processing technologies. We could democratize it so it descends from its stations among prophets and messiahs and becomes available for everyone to know and love. We could use synthetic biology to give divinity a new meaning and purpose, not for it to be hidden, but to greet and welcome us all where we stand. Thank you.